Hey, everybody, we're here talking about Bitcoin prices. No, just kidding. Uh, actually, welcome to Disrupt TV. We're going to choose our guests in reverse order. And of course, we'll start with Asha, Peter, and Dr. Jacques Atali. So let's start with Asha. Where are you calling in from? What are we talking about? And I think I'm so close to you, yet I'm not. Hey, Ray, welcome to New York. That's where I'm calling in from. Uh, my name is Asha Arvind Action, Vice President of Operations at Sprinkler, which is a CXM technology company based here in the city. And I'm also a new author. I just published a book called Skills, the Common Denominator on Career Development. All right. We'll go to you, Peter. Thank you, Ray. Uh, delighted to be here. I'm the founder and president of MetaStrategy. I advise a lot of technology and digital executives. Um, I think we'll be talking about my latest book, my third, Getting to Nimble. Looking forward to it. All right. And of course, uh, Jacques, um, it's on, where are you calling him from? What are you talking about? I am calling from Paris. Uh, I am the CEO of my own consulting firm, Italian Associates, and I chair Foundation, Positive Plan Foundation. And I'm going to talk about the concept of economy of life as an answer to the uh, pandemics and the follow up of it. Well, that's wonderful. Okay, so um, do the honors, Anna. We're going to get Anna, we're going to kick off and uh, with our guests and some introductions. So let's start the show. Okay, we'll start in three, two, one. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us on Disrupt TV. My name is Vala Afshar. I'm the Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce and your co host for the next hour. We welcome you to follow us on Twitter at Disrupt TV Show. Send Ray, myself, our distinguished guests your questions live using hashtag Disrupt TV, and we'll do our best to answer them during the show. It's my pleasure to introduce my co-host, Ray Wong. He's the CEO and founder of Constellation Research. He's the best-selling uh, author of Everybody Wants to Rule the World, Surviving and Thriving in a World of Digital Giants. Ray is a regular television business and technology news contributor on Fox Business, Yahoo Finance, CNBC, and Wall Street Journal. He's, in my opinion, one of the top futurists to follow on Twitter at RWANG0. Welcome, Ray Wong, to Disrupt TV. Hey, thank you. And I'm here with my awesome co-host, co-founder, Vala Afshar. He's the chief digital evangelist at Salesforce. He's also the author of The Pursuit of Social Business Excellence. Executives around the world pay attention to every one of his inspirational and insightful tweets. And more importantly, when he's not hosting, when he's not keynoting or leading events at Salesforce and other places, you can find him speaking on business TV outlets such as Bloomberg and posting insightful insights, including this show on ZDNet. So with that, let's talk about our our first guest, which blows us away, talk about what's going on. So who do we have it first? Is, it is an honor, and I apologize. This is an abbreviated bio. Uh, our first guest is Dr. Jacques Atali, a writer, a futurologist, president of Positive Planet Foundation. Dr. Atali is a professor of economics in many French universities. For more than a decade, Dr. Atali served as special advisor to French President François Mitterrand. Dr. Atali founded four international institutions, uh, the Positive Planet Foundation uh, and other entities of Positive Planet have been promoting the positive economy and supporting the creation of positive businesses around the world. Dr. Atali has written, Ray, he has written 83 books, oh my sold God. 10 million <laughs> copies, translated oh in 22 languages. <laughs> yes. What's uh, he doing Dr. on our show, actually? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's uh, just unbelievable. Dr. Atali's main field of research and writing are on different dimensions of the future, technologies, economy, ideologies, geopolitics, and values. Dr. Tali has conducted several orchestras uh, around the world, Paris, London, Jerusalem, Montreal, Helsinki, and more. You can one, uh, follow his wonderful insights on Twitter at J-A-T-T-A-L-I. Welcome, Dr. Tali, to Disrupt TV. Welcome. I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, with such uh, an introduction, I can only get out. I am only going to disappoint you now. <laughs> it's an honor for us no. that you're here. It is a massive honor to have you here. I think no, we had a chance to interview you with my friend Gravinder when we were on a clubhouse and uh, you were talking about some of the hinting about that new book. And uh, let's talk, what is the economy of life? What is that about? Why did you take that subject? Um, and why is that of interest? And why should that be important to us? Uh, first, it is more interesting to understand what is not economy of life, to understand what it is. What is not economy of life, it's economy of death, which is everything which is linked to something that kills people, which means everything which is linked to uh, fossil fuels, which means oil, gas, plastic, chemistry, uh, and even in a certain sense, mobility, car industry, uh, tourism, uh, textiles, uh, some part of agriculture what is linked to artificial uh, sugar, which is also a poison uh, without mm. uh, 
uh, uh, forgetting uh, tobacco and some others. And it is strange to, to realize that everything which is linked to this economy of life, of death, represent in our countries, US, Europe, whatever, more than 50% of the GDP. While the rest, which is in my view, what should could be called economy of life and should be going from 40% of the GDP to 60, 70, 80% of the GDP is health, education, digital, renewable energy, sustainable uh, agriculture, healthy food, hygiene, sport, democracy, media, logistics, uh, sound finance, and some other sectors, which uh, unfortunately uh, have been felt as missing drast dramatically during the pandemics. And we realized that. And then today, the main important challenge is to focus all our investments, all our consumer behavior on these sectors. We should be high, behave as saying, do I buy, do I produce, do I promote economy of life sectors, or do I promote the other sectors? And as far as the other sectors, a lot of things has to be done. We cannot uh, close uh, all raffineries overnight. A lot of things should be done to retrain, reshape, reorganize these sectors in order to move to a sustainable planet, both in terms of climate, in terms of uh, um, governance, in terms of health, in terms of culture and education. It's true that climate is an urgent issue, but training and education is a, also a fundamental issue and we will not deal with climate if we don't deal with education and with health. It's why there is a kind of global comprehensive system of economy of life. We should be, the, in German, they say Weltanschung, the world vision, the uh, global project that we should all have. Um, uh, the World Bank should be uh, only investing in the economy of life sectors. The uh, American budget should be focusing on that. The uh, uh, Any central bank should not sustain any any bonds which are not linked to that, either to economy of life or to reorganization of other sectors into that direction. And that's a fast, fascinating challenges, fascinating in many sectors uh, to retrain, reorganize, reorient. Uh, for instance, tourism must be reoriented towards hospitality. Uh, food must be reoriented towards healthy food. Uh, prevention is fundamental. It's why hygiene is absolutely essential sector. And digital is everywhere. It's true that digital per se is a sector of economy of life, but as we have seen during the pandemic, no sector of economy of life can survive without digital. I encourage our uh, audience to uh, look for an article recently um, written by Dr. Tali from survival mode economy to economy of life. And in that article, Dr. Tali highlights health, art, uh, agriculture, education, research, innovation, clean energy, digital technology as the sectors uh, in this economy of life that today, as he said, represent about 50% of the GDP, but, but also 50% of it, uh, employment, about 40 to 70% range. And we need to move the dial to 80%. In this article, you also mentioned companies operating in other sectors must redirect their businesses towards economy of life. And you mentioned automobile, aeronautics, textile, fashion, chemical, mechanical tools, carbon energy, luxury goods as some of the sectors uh, uh, where they, they need to realize that, that it's really important to diversify and add value to the economy of life. And you said that these companies are not condemned as long as their executives, the politicians, union leaders can mobilize ways to provide the same service in this new economy of life. There's a place for these companies. But uh, in a subsequent article, you talked about how do you measure uh, your contribution and impact to economy of life? And you said there's sustainability across four dimensions. And the dimensions are economical, ecological, social, and governance. And, and that, that we should establish indices that you have already established to measure the impact, positive impact of companies, cities, governments, institutions in this economy of life. Can you talk about these four dimensions and why they're so important and so yeah, robust? They are, they are well known now by, by the UN and by different entities like uh, OECD and, and other, other groups. Um, uh, in order to have a, uh, mankind surviving in 2050, we need to be sustainable economically, of course. If we collapse economically, we are all dead. We need to be uh, sustainable in terms of environment. Uh, not only climate, but also uh, 
waste, uh, pollution, uh, sea, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We need to, need to be sustainable on that action. We need also to be sustainable in terms of social uh, balance. Uh, if, uh, as it is today, we have a world with uh, very few, very rich people and a huge number of very poor, and the transparency of media demonstrating that, we are going to have revolutions and the collapse of the whole system without any replacement. Therefore, we need a balanced world socially where the meritocracy, the capacity of people to attend, to reach whatever level is possible, which is almost true in, in the US or in France, but not, not well true, not really true, as we know with minorities. And we need to abat. And the last uh, fourth dimension is governance, which means balance in genders, fight against corruption, transparency, uh, balance of minorities, ex everything which is linked to a, a democratic uh, governance. There is no sustainability of a world without those four dimensions. And if these four dimensions are well monitored, and as you said, my foundation has developed indexes to measure them, we measure the positivity of countries and companies and, uh, and banks. Uh, for instance, we have measured the positivity of all the countries of OECD since uh, uh, eight years now, and we rank them from the beginning to, uh, to the be best to the worst. The best are the Scandinavian countries plus New Zealand, which are far away from the others. US is number 11 or 12 on the, this ranking of 40 countries. France is much below, uh, around 20. And it's very, it would be, it would be a wonderful thing if the uh, media are waiting each year with the same eager, the ranking on the positive in index as they are expecting the ranking in GDP or whatever mm -hmm. kind of uh, well-known indexes of today. And Dr. Atali, these indices can be applied to startups and small, medium businesses, any yes, size. It's, it's very important. We, we, we do also our best to help startup to be positive. Because if you have a startup which is which is ruining one of those four dimensions, is, is worse than anything. If you have a startup or which grows and become a, a giant, which is polluting the world, what's the, what's the, the benefit of it? We need to have positive startup within the framework of economy of life. Positive startup, positive company within the framework of economy of life, which means health tech, ed tech, uh, uh, health education, health uh, agriculture all these sectors, and it's the only way to move from 40% of a GDP to 80% or 70% of a GDP is to have positive startup within the framework of economy of life. Yeah, that prioritization is so important. And when we think about that prioritization, I mean, it also affects, you know, what uh, what we do going forward, right? We have to get the priorities and rebalance um, appropriately. Now, one of the things that you've been talking about um, here as well has been really lessons that we've learned from this pandemic and lessons learned that we can carry forward. Some of that's in uh, what you're talking about here. Um, what are some specific, if you've got two or three that you would focus in on that we've learned in the pandemic that we can take towards this positive uh, approach? One is the importance of uh, forecasting. Because if we had forecast before, I can, I can speak as, at length on that, but if we had forecast of the pandemics as the South Koreans have done, mm -hmm. and not as the poor Chinese have done, the Chinese have been poorly managed on that, but the South Korean was very good at, at forecast, and they managed very well the first part of the pandemics because they are forecast six years ago what was needed. Uh, uh, forecasting, forecasting, and what is the... Uh, the other dimension of forecasting, if you forecast and you do, do nothing, it's better not to forecast. Therefore, uh, what is worst is procrastination. Uh, don't take decision. Uh, wait. I mean, in, 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 the, in the American movie uh, uh, ideology or whatever, you have a Western movie. And when the Indians are attacking the, uh, the uh, supposed uh, nice guys, there's always a cavalry which is coming and, and save them. And we wait in our unconscious, we wait for the cavalry. We think that someone, something will happen that will save us. It's not true. Uh, procrastination <laughs> will not save us. That will be no. no cavalry to save us from the climate disaster or for the uh, social disaster or the fall that, that disaster that I just mentioned. Uh, dictatorship can be a better system, no. As we see, it's another issue to discuss. China will fail, in my view. I don't believe in the success of China because, as we have seen, and it's another lesson of the pandemics. China lies 
lied, and more than anything, China lied to himself. Chinese didn't say the truth to the higher level in the Chinese hierarchy, and then that was a catastrophe. If you lie, as we have seen in the Soviet Union, if you lie, you lose. And even in your personal life, if you lie to yourself, you're dead. And uh, if you don't lie to yourself, then you face a problem and you do not procrastinate. You know that no one else will do the job that you are supposed to do. That's, uh, in my view, the most important lesson. Do not procrastinate. Act in favor of the interest of next generations and you will save yourself. In, in an article titled, Everything is Fine and Then, question mark, you said we don't marvel enough at the fact that less than 18 months after the emergence of an unknown virus, more than 2 billion doses of a radically new vaccine has been injected, of which almost no one has had any idea a year ago. Uh, but you also remind us uh, the precautions are being thrown overboard. Masks, testing, isolation, quarantines are being abandoned. And you said we want to go back to consuming, but not really to producing. We're also so happy with all kinds of aid that we would like to last. In short, we would like to have the best of the pandemic, aid as substitute for work, and the best of its disappearance, the right to have fun and consume. It's Thank another you. lesson for us to uh, approach life with a little bit of pragmatic yes. optimism. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, you know, I, I'm neither optimistic nor pessimist. I think we must add. Uh, I, I, very, I, I will answer to your point, but on this point of optimism, I very often take the example of soccer or even basketball. They say basketball. If you, if you are a, a spectator of a basketball match, sure. you support your team and you're optimist or pessimist for your team. Yes. But you are, if you are on the playground, it's useless to be optimistic or pessimistic. You have to win. You have to play. Right. And if you are optimistic or pessimist, you are bound to lose because you don't do what is needed, which is think of strategy, uh, organizing your team, understand wh what is the, the strategy of the other people. And then to be a optimistic or pessimist is, an, is a behavior of spectator. You are bound to lose. Therefore, we must play the match and the match is not lost. Um, uh, what, what, what you said before about the, uh, the uh, importance of what was your question? I, I, Cannot remember. Uh, the question was: It seemed, you know, we can't abandon. Uh, you know, uh, we must continue to have uh, exercise pragmatic optimism, but recognize that there is work and effort to survive in this pandemic era, uh, and we can't just earn, you know, yearn for the niceties and ignore the reality. Like reality in the U.S., we're about to approach 650,000 deaths in those 18 months, uh, and it doesn't seem like in certain yeah. geographies in the country, yeah. we still, you know, have incredible high rate of positive COVID uh, outcomes. Yeah, to go back of your remarks, there is also lessons to be taken from the former pandemic, which is called the Spanish flu, which was actually not, yeah. was not a Spanish flu. You, you know what? It's why it was called a Spanish flu, because it was yes. the only country where there was no flu. Uh, because there was uh, there was no no so, 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 sorry there was no censorship because Spain was out of the war and therefore we knew that there was a flu in this country while in the U.S. or in France where there was censorship because of the war we don't know that there was a flu and then after the flu everybody came back to the uh, life as it was be before in English the, in in America you say the Roaring Twenties uh, in French we say les années folles. What happened after the 20s? The 30s, uh, the, the uh, uh, Great Crash uh, and the Second World War. If we come back, uh, if we have a Khmer, which means that we forget the whole thing and we try to go back to what was before, which means which is another way to procrastinate, not acting, not reorienting not our economy to economy of life and, and not thinking of the importance of um, uh, forecasting it's very difficult to to be able to will to be willing to forecast in our personal life also we we don't dare to forecast because if we if we forecast we have to think of our own personal death yes which is also something that is uh, has been the lesson of these pandemics that remind us that even if we like to be entertained if we like to play whatever kind of uh social media games we are going to die and it's very very important to to try to have a, a good time before we die and to prepare for a better life for, for our children. Uh, and then uh, it's very difficult to, to, to put in ourselves in the philosophy of 
thinking about the future. And without that, mankind is going to suicide. Doomed. Yes, yeah. we are doomed. Uh, Dr. Atali, uh, before you leave, I want to talk about your Positive France project. Uh, you're working at the head of the French elections. And uh, can you share a little bit about that work and uh, what you're doing uh, for that? Well, that's something I do also for other countries when I'm asked to do it. But uh, we have developed with a huge number of uh, young, bright and brilliant people. We have interviewed during six months the most important 400 people of France, scholars, politicians, business people, sociologists, etc. And we get out of that with uh, 250 reforms that are badly needed for the country, whoever is in charge. And we will put that on the table before the elections, actually next month, which is what is good for a positive France. And uh, this uh, bipartisan action of experts, I think, could be useful for uh, other countries to, to launch. And when does that start? When will you launch that? It is launched. The, the book will be, it's not one of my book because it's a collective book. Then it will be not rated as one of mine. <laughs> it will be published in a month. I'm sure the 84th book is around the corner. So <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it's coming. So we're here with Dr. Jacques Attali, um, writer, futurist, uh, president of the Positive Planet Foundation. You can follow him on Twitter at J Attali, and you can also find his works at www.attali.com. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ray, <laughs> that, was, that was amazing. Humble. I'm so humbled. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I don't even want to talk about that. I'm working on my second book. Okay, our, our next guest, <laughs> Peter High, is the president of Metro Strategy, host of Technovation podcast, columnist for Forbes, author and keynote speaker. Peter founded Metro Strategy in 2001. He's an expert in business and information technology strategy, and he's been a trusted advisor to a wide array of business and technology executives ranging from Fortune 500 companies to various industries. Peter's the author of a new book titled Getting to Nimble, it's so important right now, Getting to Nimble, How to Transform Your Company into a Digital Leader. The book was number one new release in business management on Amazon. Peter's also the author of World Class IT, Why Business Succeed When IT Triumphs, which was named the third best IT business book by CIO Insight and the number one book to read to be smarter than your boss according to Baseline Magazine. Uh, Peter uh, followed the success of that book with implementing world-class IT strategy, How IT Can Drive Organizational Innovation, a book that became Amazon bestseller again. Uh, Peter also writes a column for Forbes, writing about topics of the intersection of IT and business. He's published more than 650 articles to date and more than 12 million page views. Prolific writer. Uh, since 2008, Peter has moderated a widely listened to podcast entitled Technovation with Peter High, which is available on a weekly basis. You can follow Peter on Twitter at Peter A. Hi, H-I-G-H. Welcome, Peter, to Disrupt TV. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, Vala. Thank you, sir. Hey, welcome to the show. And hey, I've had the privilege of being on your podcast as well and following you in a keynote just recently. It's amazing to have you on. Let's start by talking about your book, Getting to Nimble. What's the concept? What is Nimble? And uh, how do we even get started uh, in that area? So, and, and, and really, what drove you to do this? Yeah, thank you, Ray. I appreciate that. And it is a pleasure to be on, on, on your show after you graced mine. You did such a nice job on mine. Uh, um, well, so like you, I study what separates successful companies from those uh, who are unable to, to achieve long-term success. Um, those companies that can reinvent themselves and compete with themselves ultimately, not resting on the laurels of past accomplishments. And so really, it's, it's an idea I was banding about since the release of my second book. But there were a couple of uh, crystallizing conversations for me that were very helpful. Uh, number one, I had a, a chance, uh, this is probably four or five years ago, to uh, to, to speak at a conference uh, at which Ben Freed, the then and current chief information officer of Google, was also speaking. And he and I have become friends over the years. And I asked him, you know, he's 13 years in role, probably, you know, eight or so back when we were speaking at this point. And I said, across that time, you've, you've seen such growth and yet the company maintains its entrepreneurial spirit and ability to innovate despite becoming a definitive behemoth. And so what, what's behind that? What would you attribute it to? And he said, uh, the key is that we make change a core competence. 
and we hire accordingly, we train accordingly, we reward accordingly. Uh, and I thought that was like a really fantastic insight that, you know, if, if as the saying goes, change is the one constant uh, that we can we can bank on, then we need to make sure we're preparing our teams for that, indeed, our, our companies for that as well. And then the second sort of idea and conversation that helped crystallize some things for me was an interview I did in late 2016 with the uh, chief information officer and chief technology officer of CarMax, a guy named Shumi Mohammed. And um, I asked him at the end of my podcast interview with him, uh, what are some of the trends that excite you as you look to the future? And as I recall, he he talked about machine learning and he talked about blockchain and he had an anecdote or two relative to each as to their application back to CarMax. But he concluded his remarks by saying, look, if we're talking about trends and we look out, let's say, three years from now, uh, the pace of change is so uh, fast that the number one trend that we will be investing in maybe something you and I can't even name today. So above all else, what I need to do is create a, an organization that is nimble. And so what did he yes. mean by that? Uh, an organization that could seize opportunities readily and stave off issues as they present themselves. Because today is the fastest the business environment has ever been, and yet it's the slowest it will be from this point forward. So as a result, we need to be able to pivot rapidly you know, towards opportunity away from danger, and thus the concept of getting to nimble. What a great, what a great way to uh, lesson from the Google CIO like to, to learn, unlearn, relearn, and to change yourself is a superpower, um, which uh, which I think successful CIOs um, um, understand and embrace. And, and in your book, Getting to Nimble, you highlight well, you highlighted CarMax, so that's a company. Which I mean, you went from countries to companies, from country of Estonia yep. to Capital One, FedEx, Washington Post, Domino's Pizza. Which, by the way, in terms of stock return, has been one of the most successful companies in the last decade. Most people don't know. Large companies like the largest employer in the U.S., Walmart. It was a fantastic array of case studies in your book. Again, from countries to largest companies to, to startups. So what, what are the common characteristics, elements? What's in the DNA of nimble organizations? Are they two or three characteristics that business leaders need to understand and, and then champion throughout their organization? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that feedback, Vala, uh, and great question. I, I think you need to focus on a few things in order to accomplish this. And number one, you need to set the appropriate expectation personally, but also with your teams, your peers, your superiors, those who work for you, that this is not a light switch. Uh, getting to a nimble culture and a nimble orientation is going to take time. Uh, but the important thing to remember is that there are building blocks to get there. And that's really what I go through in the book. There are five major themes and 27 sub themes that I point to as the, the levers that you should be pulling with some insinuation as to the order in which you might tackle some of those things. Let, let me just give you an overview briefly of the five themes themselves, Avala. So it begins with people. Um, you know, all else could be you may have uh, you know world class processes and technologies. If you don't have a great team, then the the other two are not going to get you much, frankly. So having a great team that has a learning nimbleness associated with this, this is certainly an important theme throughout this. This uh, ability to change again, not resting on the laurels personally of your accomplishments or your degrees, because rapidly what you learned in at university is going to becoming irrelevant. And so get, building a team that is itself always striving to build the the skills of tomorrow. Um, and, and recognizing, frankly, this is a transformation that will never end. Uh, get, and get, getting back to that whole notion of the need for change as a core competence, and also winning the war for talent. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. these days, um, that it, it seems particularly acute. And so, making sure that you're focused on the right sorts of elements to keep the best people uh, in your team, while also then attracting fantastic people to your team. So that's the first one. The second one is processes. So uh, ensuring that you are building the processes, again, uh, uh, that, that, that are the processes of the future. A few of the elements, I won't list them exhaustively, but include you know, having um, an agile approach to development. Uh, and in speaking of development, a pivot from the traditional project orientation to a product orientation. Uh, and, and with that, assembling teams from uh, sort of unusual bedfellows, if you will, from across the organization with a degree of permanency within those products to continue to sort of update and innovate around the, the, those products that you define. And, um, and then other practices such as DevOps, yet another, as the portmanteau suggests, uh, 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 de development and operations stuck together is creating permeable uh, filters across the traditional silos of the organization so that there's a greater degree of collaboration across them. Um, and then the, the third element, the third theme is technology. Uh, 
you know, it's a, depending upon the choices that you've made and how long you've been making them for many great organizations, leading organizations have have basically museum grade technology running significant aspects of their operations. And that's something they really need to to grapple with, both for the, the risk implications, as well as the cost implications and ultimately the nimble implications. And so, you know, get getting a, a modern cloud centric uh, tech stack, you know, investing in APIs and microservices, of course, thinking about all of that with a security lens to it becomes very important. Um, fourth, the fourth element is ecosystems. Uh, that competition today is much less company to company, even more ecosystem to ecosystem. And the idea really is to cast your net very widely across your ecosystem for insight. And then lastly, strategy. You know, there are those who might say that uh, if you commit a strategy to to paper that by the time the ink dries, uh, good portions of it will be irrelevant. And that's true. But what I would say is because speed matters today, creating great strategies that are understood by the entire organization, not just the few at the top, and ensure that everyone's pushing in the same direction is the fastest path to accomplishing those and getting, getting the, those outcomes as quickly as possible. Um, and then throughout all of this, I would say is making sure that you are measuring progress or lack thereof, because of course, what gets measured gets done. And so, I, as I say, I highlight 27 areas to focus on, as well as even some metrics to suggest that organizations follow to gauge that progress or lack thereof, so that you have this means, of course, correcting over time. Terrific. I love the graceful uh, museum grade <laughs> description of technical debt and legacy infrastructure. I love that. It's, <laughs> Go ahead, it's so true and so sad. Um, but anyway, yes, <laughs> something to be preserved as an artifact of time. But hey, you know what I did? I did what I really did like was the in the strategy area on strategic nimbleness. You talked about a couple of things, a data strategy, um, driving innovation, developing IT digital strategy. Um, that's a hard skill and hard place for nimbleness to occur, um, what's missing or what's required in terms of the capabilities inside of leaders or inside of organizations for that to happen? Because they're too often focused on short-term goals. Hmm. That's true, Ray. Yeah, it's a great insight. And I, I think you, you hit on several of the really important elements to this. Uh, you know, um, different organizations may, may do reasonably well at articulating an enterprise level strategy. And then as you get deeper and deeper into the levels of granularity of strategy, uh, oftentimes you have a, a, a little bit of, a, you know, a weaker and weaker translation of that enterprise strategy into the divisions of the organizations and ultimately to the data strategy that becomes so much more critical these days. So making sure that you have line of sight between, you know, what, what the corporation intends to do and the role that each of the divisions have to play in order to drive to to that let, let me let me paint a quick picture of that so every for-profit uh, organization has has some version of grow revenue as as a as a goal of theirs now how that then is accomplished is going to be different for the marketing department than it will be for product or service areas than it will be for the m a portion of your organization for instance as each of them have levers that they're going to pull in order to assist in growing that revenue so each of them need to be developing their own plans of course very much tied to that that uh that focal point at the top likewise uh, the tech and digital uh and, and all the more so these days has an enormous role to play when it comes to uh to, to its own levers and growing that revenue staying with that example for, for a moment longer, uh, through digital means, all the more important, I might add, through through COVID and the, the need to, to lean on digital channels for, for revenues these days. But then the, the critical aspect of this, which is still in its infancy, I've pulled hundreds, pr probably about a thousand CIOs across the, the gatherings I've had in the past 18 months uh, to gauge this very topic. Uh, when I ask, you know, CIO, CDO, CTOs, what is your what are your top priorities? Almost always some version of data and analytics and all the various aspects that are tied yeah. to it yeah. rises to the top. When I ask the follow up question, as I often do, of what rate the maturity of your data strategy capabilities, it's actually still relatively low. And that gap represents a tremendous opportunity for those who can can uh, can close it as quickly as possible, because it's the data ultimately that where you are going to find the gold. Where you're going to understand, you know, how well you were doing uh, as a team, how well you were doing and interacting with your customers. Of course, how well your products and services are selling, and insights as to what new ones or enhancements or bundles might might uh, uh, might, might grow that even further. So that that I, this the elements associated with strategy could never could, couldn't be more important during these times. Terrific, terrific insights, um, Peter. I feel like I work for a company that's nimble. Um, I, we, I certainly believe my colleagues and I appreciate the uh, importance of velocity, speed and direction of, of our work. Um, and I, I believe culture is a, really an important element uh, th that helps us cultivate that 
unquenchable thirst for innovation and co-creation of value. And it was, I think, Seth Godin who said, people are not afraid of failure, they're afraid of blame. So hmm. in order to be nimble, in order to embrace change and uncertainty, you certainly need to have a strong culture where you can experiment. And one of your five pillars in terms of ecosystem, I think is an important secret sauce for my company as well. I think we have a very healthy ecosystem in the 21 year existence of my company. Um, can you talk about the importance of culture or any other, you know, trust, core values, talent, process, like you mentioned, in terms of how do you build a better ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Because I think that really is a super important pillar of your five pillars. Well, I appreciate you raising that one. Yeah, I, I think it is particularly compelling. And oftentimes an area where, as I'm speaking with uh, the many people that I advise, that is least mature and perhaps even not thought about enough. Sure. And so the elements of this, uh, well, first of all, as I mentioned before, um, competition is much less Coke versus Pepsi or GM versus Ford. It is ecosystem to ecosystem. Who are you bringing to the party with you uh, that are going to help you drive positive incomes, uh, outcomes rather, positive outcomes for your organization and do so as quickly as possible. And so, you know, you think about uh, the joint ventures that you put together, the mm. managed services providers who, who you engage with, your supply chain uh, and the various companies that, that, that uh, provide um, critical elements to that, just to name three very obvious of many aspects uh, that, that are counted among the ecosystem. But moreover, what I would say is each of us personally need to think about our ecosystems. And if I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to uh, you know an executive, what I, what I often test with them, engage with them is, it's, talk to me a bit about uh, your customers, your customer touch points, and uh, you know, how well you are engaged with them. Um, it, 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 having that close proximity to, to insight with some trusted people among the customer set becomes very important as to how you think about shaping your product or service offering. Uh, your peers. Uh, so if you're a tech or digital executive, for instance, do you have a kitchen cabinet of, sort, of sorts of your peers? Because, you know, these roles rhyme, even if they're very different businesses. And you need to find that half dozen or dozen uh, um, peers who you can turn to when you've got a critical question or a, or a serious issue that you're facing or an opportunity uh, that, to, to validate the hypotheses uh, that you're putting together more readily. Uh, another element is the venture capital community. And it's interesting, a lot of digital and technology executives don't understand the symbiosis that exists between their roles and the VCs, especially those, of course, who, who invest in enterprise technology. There's a big, great hunger among that community to, again, test hypotheses as to where they might be investing and you know the, the, the theses, the various theses that, that uh, are behind where they're doing so. And, and for, for those CIOs, digital technology officers to become advisors of sorts through the process also. Uh, and, uh, another element is executive recruiters. And I, I mean that less from the perspective of finding your next job and more from the perspective of understanding how are teams evolving? What skills are on the rise? What are on the, on the fall? Um, how are org, org changes? What are the implications of those and how that might they translate back into my organization and so forth? And the last one, not unlike the, the, the company you hail from, Bala, um, finding some really great strategic partners, people who you're engaging presumably because of the wealth of experience they have across many different industries and companies and tapping them where appropriate, of course, uh, tapping them for greater insight and inspiration that might lead to innovations. So the idea is really casting that net widely across this group for yeah. faster sources of both insight as well as an ability readily to test those hypotheses, as I noted. I love the fact that you bring the concept of ecosystem to an individual, like asking a CIO what percentage of your time is spent with external customers versus internal customers to understand the elasticity and expansion of their ecosystem, personalized ecosystem. I love that is massive sage advice. <laughs> Thank uh, you. So I hope our listeners like wrote that down because I, I plan to. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Uh, we'll have a replay. We'll catch that you on the replay. That was terrific. <laughs> that, that's a tweet worthy of many, many millions of impressions once we're done with the show. So go ahead, Ray. <laughs> And yeah, but hey, related to that though, I mean, this nimbleness, right? We might have found some lost nimbleness, our capabilities um, through the COVID, right? I mm -hmm. mean, the companies that succeeded, we, we you know, actually found and figured out how to flex those nimble muscles uh, along the way. What did you discover along, you know, with that? And uh, what did you see uh, companies do to actually, you know, rekindle that capability? So, well, get, Ray, it's, uh, it, it's, I would say COVID has been the mother of all pivots, has led to the mother of all pivots, the necessity for that. You know, as I alluded to earlier, um, now companies need to lean on their digital revenue streams, assuming they have them. Uh, they need to interact with customers digitally, assuming they have the pathways to do so. They need to, you know, weigh the health of their operation and the health of their colleagues. 
uh, and to a greater degree do so digitally for obvious reasons, because there were impediments for much of the past nearly 19 months for us to be together. And then gauging the productivity of the operation and colleagues as well to make sure that work is getting done. Um, th this is just a few of the areas in which all of us have had to pivot in really profound ways. And so what I would say is, all things being equal, and I say all things being equal because uh, there are certainly, if you're, a, if you're a hotel or hospitality company or an airline, you could have been the best in those industries and you still were going to be hurt naturally because of the consequences yeah. of, of, of uh, uh, you know, of the pandemic. But what I would say is all things being equal, those organizations that invested in nimble transformation earliest are the ones who are doing best through this process. Because again, that nimbleness has allowed them to pivot in ways that I've just described, for instance, uh, to be able to... To, you know, f take the lemon and make lemonades, uh, uh, take the lemons and make lemonade rather, and uh, find opportunity where others can't uh, readily do so to the same degree. What that also means, I would say, Ray, is the exit velocity for those leaders of industries uh, is going to be profound relative to the, the secondary and tertiary players in those same industries. The advantages are multiplying as a result of their ability to do special things while others are languishing during these very trying times. And so I, I do think that so those who survive and, and are still secondary players, there's going to be a hunger to follow the leader and to do some of these very same things. But those who had the wisdom without knowing, of course, uh, that they, there would be a pandemic that would test their uh, uh, test the plans they were putting together. But those who had the wisdom to go through these nimble transformations earliest, again, all things being equal, are the ones who have maintained those leadership positions. Peter, my final question. Exponential gaps. Um, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. My, my, my final question is, oh, you're a prolific speaker, advisor, writer. Uh, what are some of the exciting areas you plan to spend your time researching and talking and writing about? And how can people find you? How, oh, how, thank how, you. How can our audience connect with you? I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for asking, Vala. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm focusing a lot of a, a lot at present on some of the sort of next wave of, of insights related to this. What's been really great is as people have been reading my book, Getting to Nimble, I've been uh, reconnecting with or connecting for the first time with a great number of organizations who either prior to reading the book or because uh, they've been doing so are now going through nimble transformations and sort of diagnosing what are the practices that are working well? What's What are some of the ways in which, you know, the leaders versus the, the secondary and tertiary players as, as I described, you know, what, what was the inspiration for them? Uh, absent a, a, a need as, as clear and present as a, as a pandemic for that change. And so what I want to try to do is, is continue to hone that story so that as, as I'm advising those very technology and digital executives, I've got the sort of continued arsenal or weaponry associated with uh, building organizations that will be nimble for the long term and successful for the long term as well. You're very kind to ask uh, also how people can find me. They can certainly find me in LinkedIn um, at uh, uh, Twitter at Peter A. Hi. Um, certainly, I would be honored if they would ch uh, check out Ray's inter that I, the interview I did with Ray, among others, uh, my Technovation podcast. And, and you mentioned in the, that very nice introduction, uh, my Forbes column as well, which comes out a couple times a week. Um, those are some, some good places to find me. Great work. We're here with Thank Peter Hyde, so president of MetaStrategy, host of the Technovation podcast and columns at Forbes, author and keynote speaker. And you can find him on Twitter at Peter A. Hi. Thank you so much for being on the show. Happy Friday and hope to see you around soon on the speaking circuit. Thank you, Thank gentlemen. You, Great to see you both. Thank you. Terrific insights. Uh, so, okay, this is our cleanup hitter spot where we have an extraordinary guest come and hit a grand slam, and there's no exception here. So it's our privilege to speak to Asha Arvindakshan, uh, who is the Vice President of Customer Delight and Operations at Sprinkler, where she works with other senior executives on cross-functional initiatives to achieve the corporate values of employee happiness, customer happiness, and growth. There's no better time than now to focus on stakeholder happiness and growth. Asha is the author of, because we only invite extraordinary authors on the show, is the author of a new book, Skills, the Common Denominator. Again, an incredibly important topic for all business leaders. Previously, Asha streamlined business operations to maximize accountability, growth, and strategic alignment for public and private stakeholders. Asha serves on the board of directors for MIT uh, Sloan Club of New York and as a venture partner for Verb Ventures. You can follow her great work on Twitter, early adopter of Twitter, apparently, at DKasha, D-C-A-S-H-A. Welcome, Asha, to Disrupt TV. So, yeah, and um, let's see here real quick. Let me get you off mute. Go ahead. So, our end. Yeah, welcome, welcome. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me again on the show. Our pleasure. 
Yeah. So one of the interesting things, right? I mean, you're, you're writing the book, you've got this in front of you. Um, what is, what drove you to write this? Like what was missing? What did you say? Hey, you know, people aren't following this topic. Is something going on? Um, and this was, I mean, you did this in the middle of the pandemic as well. So. That's right. So it was, a, it was a number of factors. I actually gave a presentation about five, six years ago on how to use LinkedIn for personal branding and business networking. And it landed so well that I knew then that I wanted to turn it into a book so more people could access the content. It just became a matter of when. And with the pandemic, it was actually a year ago today when I had when I was on your show the, a few hours before that, that I had a conversation with a person who runs a writing program at Georgetown and said, I want to write a book about transferable skills. And wow. I want to show people how they can pivot between sectors, industries, even countries using their skills because they know how to identify and talk about them. So it's kind of amazing that how this project came together over the past year. And I have a book to hold in my hand right now because of it. <laughs> That's that so awesome. cool. That is so cool. We've been, we've been talking about dynamic skills, the need for continuous learning, how people get there. I mean, there's a big gap, right? Nine and a half million people are... Well, nine and a half million jobs are available, but nine million people are out of work. I mean, that's a right. massive mismatch that's going on out there. And this book could be there to help them get there. So sorry about that. Go yeah. ahead, Bob. So. No, no, no. It's a, the book is amazing. You're amazing. In the book, you, you talk about how to differentiate yourself uh, as a candidate. You have uh, 25 some odd stories of career changers and how they can, how, how you can learn from them to, again, better position yourself for success. And you talk about uh, identifying transferable skills. You talk about building a professional brand uh, and how you can stand up in a job search. You talk about leveraging digital tools to, like LinkedIn, as you mentioned, to secure interviews and stay organized. You talk about cultivating your network to find a role. That ecosystem discussion Peter had in terms of how do you exactly. expand your community. And you also talk about keeping an open mind on today's top transferable skills. Of these pillars, these lessons that you so thoughtfully, remarkably include in your book, can you talk about personal branding and how individuals can expand their share of voice? And, and because I, through my career, I found that real job security is knowing you can work elsewhere. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and that really speaks to uh, how successful you are, with, you know, personal brand. Absolutely. And the personal branding aspect, some people will say, well, I'm not looking for a job. I don't need a personal brand. I don't need a pitch. Yeah. And I bet you're selling something, <laughs> right? And so you need to be able to say who you are, what you're trying to do, and answer the question for the other person, how can I help you? And that could mean I'm looking for something. Can you help me find it? I'm looking to sell something. Can you find connect me to someone, right? I'm looking to build something. Can you help me find a yep. partner, right? There's so many iterations of that. But if you get the basis of a pitch that addresses those three points, you'll be very successful every time you walk into a room or a conversation and introduce yourself. I love that. I love the element which you led with is how can I help you? Mm -hmm. Because um, I find the most successful networkers are, are, are just trying to be helpful. Um, and they're very unselfish in the way they offer help. In other words, they don't necessarily expect something in return. They're just there to help. And I think that's a, that's a really important element of successfully establishing trust. Uh, because, you know, uh, folks like you and I and Ray, you know, we can detect, uh, you know, sentiment. <laughs> you know, there's a, again, that fine line of inspiring and manipulating is your intent. And if you have positive intent, it's, it's amazing how many doors can open uh, as you're trying to be helpful. Go ahead, Ray. As someone who has an awesome personal brand, Ray Wong, who's always there to help, always. Oh, I met Ray on Twitter and, uh, and he was being helpful the instant we connected and he didn't even know me. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> talk for Ray. <laughs> no. Hey, so what's interesting about the book is who is in the book? Let's talk more about that mm. because I yes. think there's a lot to be learned from that um, in terms of the way you tell that story and the lessons from what's being said. Yep. So the one thing I'm really proud of is that I interviewed all 30 people that are featured in the book. They're all real people. And these are real stories that you're going to read about. And there are people who um, live and work in this country and other countries, and they've pursued careers. I've grouped them into community management, which or community development, which is maybe they work in a nonprofit or academic space. They're building online communities through social media, or maybe they're in a CSR type of role and they're helping communities that way. The next group is entrepreneurs. So you know, people who worked in really large companies decided it wasn't for them. People that went to grad school and switched com tracks completely 
or people who have always been an entrepreneur from the start and decided that was a career path from them. So you could put yourself in their shoes and see if that's what you want to be doing. Um, the other two groups are marketers who some have very interesting career paths. You know, some people grow up in marketing agencies. We said it's a very traditional path, but you may decide I want to go work in HR or finance or operations and not just be on the client side and be able to raise your hand and do that. Uh, finally, the last group, it's three management consultants who came from, you know, the big four firms mm -hmm. and they all wanted to do something else. They wanted them wanted to go be on the side of implementation of strategy, not just advising on it. One of them wanted to actually segue into social impact and successfully did that, you know, multiple times, not only through work, but through volunteer activities. And finally, the last one was in financial services. And, or, you know, that's an industry that employs millions and millions of people and is rapidly going through transformation. And she wanted to be on the other side of that transformation, leading it. So great stories. These are all, again, real people who have shared with me their journeys, how they made the change, why they made the change. And I, for the reader, have identified their three top transferable skills. So the reader can say, okay, I have these two, and now I have the words to articulate them. That's amazing. That's amazing. We had Whitney Johnson on our show talking about disrupting yourself. And That's her right. thesis is companies don't disrupt, people disrupt. So uh, speaking of disruption, how did you disrupt yourself? Like, what were, Asher, what was it, some <laughs> of the lessons you learned interviewing this diverse, large group of people? Did you walk away with, well, first you found out you're a great writer. Maybe you knew that already. <laughs> but were there <laughs> lessons you learned along the way that motivate and inspire you that are new? as a result of this process of writing a book? So it's funny because I probably talked to, you know, hundreds of people over the last 20 years about their career paths. It's just something that not like I'm just naturally fascinated by. And but by talking to these people and the interviews happened between January and May of this year. So this is very, very quick. I quickly just wow. saw the patterns. Like if you set an intention, you will achieve it. If you are patient, the opportunity will come to you. Right. These are the type of patterns that I started detecting and, and it happened very quickly too. Um, these the folks that I interviewed have an average of six pivots in their career. So they had a lot of good data points to see like over and over again, if, especially if they articulated what they were trying to do and the change they were trying to make, someone would open the door with an opportunity. And that I think is really important. Like we need to be more vocal about what we're looking for so that other people can help us. Again, it goes back to that personal branding that we talked at the beginning. Absolutely. How, what's the role of a sponsor um, in terms of helping people make, on average, six pivots? Did they happen to find an ally where the person had uh, put their political or social capital on the line as a sponsor to act as an advocate and help them, uh, you know, uh, safely pivot to a new direction in their career? Absolutely. So there are stories in the book of people who had sponsors inside their company and outside their company. Wow. Right. So that's also important and having a network that goes beyond you know, your the four walls of work. And so because that sponsor, again, is listening to you they're you know, they're investing their time in you and they want to help you. And so when they know, OK, you're ready to look or maybe you don't know you're ready to look, but you have a skill that somebody else could benefit from. They're willing to connect the dots, open the door and make a referral. So I think it's always really important to keep an open mind, take the conversation, go to the event. Right, because you just never know what's going to happen or who you're going to meet. Terrific advice. Terrific. Yeah, that's a great point. Right, I mean, I, we're continuously building networks. We're continuously moving up. Um, yesterday, I had a chance to speak to 200 women tech leaders uh, in a group called T200, who I probably shouldn't introduce and connect you to unless you're a part of, unless you're already part of that. And uh, it was interesting. One of the top conversations was how do we get on boards. Right? How do we get yes. board members, board mentorship, who sponsors you into board? How do you find that opportunity to do that? And uh, you can definitely see a lot of demand and interest in those areas. Um, but hey, back to your book, um, in terms of, you know, uh, when you think about writing a book, you finish it, you get it out the door, you're all excited. And then you're like, oh God, I wish I would have said this. Um, do you have a list of those things that you like, well, that should be in the next book? Or, you know, this is what I'm gonna be talking about when I start getting out there on the road tour and talking about this and speeches and things like that. Oh, of course. I, I think the re revisions process doesn't end. And so I definitely, you know, I put the pen down at the end of June, actually. Um, it was, you know, since then, like, well, what if I had ended the chapter this way? Should I include this? And so I think I have opportunities, again, when I'm, I'm speaking opportunities to bring them up or potentially for the hardcover, which will be out in a, in a few months to include those type of sections in the book. 
That's amazing. So your interview process started a year into the pandemic mm -hmm. where the whole world went to a decentralized, for the most part, digital only uh, engagement model to maybe now a digital first. And, you know, in my company, we believe only 15% of employees are going to go back to the office in the near term. So continue to be in this decentralized digital first. Uh, because of the pandemic, are there certain transferable skills that rose in terms of priority, uh, which 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 you can talk about? Sure, I think one's I think prioritization. Actually, yeah. right. So, <laughs> that was a great segue. <laughs> the ability to prioritize. Um, you know, I can say for myself, right? I had to prioritize my work day and then my book writing. You know, seven days a week. Uh, the ability to communicate became really important. You know, we no longer have that the in-person subtleties that we were used to having being in the same office space and in the same conference rooms. So people definitely had to have a more um, sense of just the digital uh, back to back and forth and what it means. Um, if I had to pick another one, I would say influencing without authority. Nice. Because I that, love I that. I love much, that. much harder when we're in this in this space and especially you know, so many companies are actually, like we said, we're hiring right now and there's so many new people coming on board and they don't know the lay of the land as it was when there was an office. It's a great point. And we talked about this too in a number of surveys over the past few weeks that, you know, workers that were hired in the, during the pandemic are the least logo, lo, loyal. I mean, we've seen the highest attrition rates in those workers hired in the last 18 months than anywhere else. And it's because there's no sense of connection, no sense of belonging. And for all the talk about remote work being awesome, um, that lack of connection has to be solved. Otherwise, we're going to see a lot, a lot of attrition. For sure. 100%. I don't think any company has solved that yet. So I thought I had a cool title until I read yours <laughs> because <laughs> Vice President of Customer Delight, it just doesn't get any cooler than that. Tell us about, you know, what, what do companies need to do to really delight? You know, to me, it's exceeding expectations to get to delight. What do, what do we need to do as individuals, as managers, as companies, especially in this uh, era where we're all struggling. I mean, we're all struggling, you know, some more than others. I referenced the unfortunate number of deaths in the U.S. in the last 18 months. But, uh, you know, advice to business leaders who are really sincerely care about delighting their customers, how do they put themselves in a position where they can do that? Picking up the phone. I think honestly, oh, bravo. That's, very true, very true. That's it, right? I think, you know, when I think about, uh, 18 months ago, we were doing daily calls with our teams, checking in multiple times in a day, right, to make sure that everyone was doing okay, especially as we were, we were trying to help everyone adjust to the new normal, mm. right? And the same thing with those customers that were coming up for renewal, let's check in, make sure they're okay, do they need anything? And I think as, you know, in some parts of the country and the world, things that are trying to get back to normal, but they're not universally. Right. And we need to remember that. And we need to remember that we still should be checking in with our friends and our colleagues and our customers that are in these parts of the world that are not back to normal, that haven't seen a change in the last 18 months. Maybe things are worse now than they were 18 months ago, which is scary saying that out loud, but it's true. And it's they true. need to have a pulse on that. And the only way to do that is to have that touch base and ask, how are you? What can I do? For how sure. can I help you? For sure. And, and definition normal has changed. I mean, I'm not sure if we'll ever be back to 2019, um, you know, when, <clears throat> when it comes to in person, in office. Uh, so absolutely pick up the phone. And by the way, pick up the phone. Like there is truly Zoom fatigue. <laughs> like it's okay to just talk. <laughs> you know? I forgot what my ringtone sounds like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <right. laughs> Somebody actually uh, called me <clears throat> and apologized. Said, Listen, I've been on like eight Zoom calls. Do you mind me if you just talk? And I'm like, oh my goodness, hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, although it does a lot, you know, I do shave and, you know, at least put on the tie when it's Zoom. So I don't mind that either. But anyway, sorry, Rick. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great point. And, and actually, one of the things that we, we keep seeing is the fact that your best friends are the ones you can pick up a phone call at any point in time. You just call. You text, you say hello, you know, by the fifth text, really just pick up the phone. And I think that's something we've all learned. But it's the same thing with email. If something takes more than three emails, set yeah. up a call and have a discussion. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely that's one a transferable of the skills we should be looking at. That is a transfer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, so this is the thing, right? Like I, I told my kids that I said, hey, look, 
go get a job. But but when you go to college, I mean, whatever it is, get something like a baseline, get into accounting or get an engineering degree or get right. like a, you know, get a, like, I mean, get an English degree, get like a, you know, get, you know, get a background in one of these areas. And then whatever happens, Right. You're going to flip. Right. The whole point right. of life is the intersections. Right. You know, you could love sports, but you can come in engineering and you end up build something, you know, for a sports team. You could love, you know, um, you know, you could love like performance and entertainment and other areas. And you can come in comp sci and start building video games. Right. It's just the beauty of what we're at a point where you can actually mix and match all these different disciplines. True. So lots of fun yeah. stuff in out my there. Research, uh, David um, Epstein, who wrote Range. He says 75% yes. of students work in something outside of their college major. I'm one of those people. I think all both of you are also. What was your major? What was your major? I was a finance major. I've never worked in finance. <laughs> yeah. I, was in, <laughs> I was electrical engineering, undergrad and grad, and I haven't done electrical engineering for a long time. My daughter uh, just got into the blockchain club at Bentley. Nice. And uh, I told her, yes, that I know it may not sound like a transferable skill now, but learn as much as you can about blockchain. So yeah, I was happy to hear that. Yeah. Well, I, I'm guilty too. I have a master's in public health, so I don't use that at all. So. But, but Ray, right, to, your, to your credit, that learning that you had from your master's degree helped the rest of us understand the pandemic last year. True. You were able to articulate what the scientists were saying in a way that the rest of us could understand. And I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Well, 100%. You. Well, thank you. Well, hey, we're talking about skills. They're super transferable. We should get the book if you get a chance. Um, skills, the common denominator. You can pick it up. Um, at, um, is it everywhere? Are we out? Or is, it's or everywhere launched? online. Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, Kobo, and Goodreads. Oh, so cool. All right. Very cool. Congrats. So we're Congrats. Asha, Vice President of Customer Delight and Operations at Sprinkler. You can follow her at DC Asha. She used to live in DC. That's why. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so anyways, go. hey, thanks a lot for being on the show. Happy Friday. Good luck on the book. And we'll see you at Constellations Connected Enterprise, October 25th. So Thank you, Asha. You Congratulations on the you. book. You're terrific. Thank you. Wow. wow. <laughs> I so I just want our part. audience to know that the five of us, our three guests and Ray and I have authored 89 books. Amazing. <laughs> what a number. 89 books. So, you know, luckily our first guest, Dr. Atali, uh, had contributed to 83 of them, but, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. They put Five us on good us, footing. We'll get to books. 100 soon. <laughs> Peter, come on. We need your fourth book. Uh, uh, wow, Ray. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, that was episode 251. Next week, episode 252, we have James Altucher, who's amazing, one of my favorite followers on Twitter, founder Great of the podcast. James Altucher Show. He's, he's an extraordinary person. Uh, Parveen Muturu, Vice President, Chief Enterprise Architect at Mars. And Brian Solis, a good friend of both Ray and Andy. Hey, yeah, you know, he's, he's, he's is a like big social media star. Global innovation global evangelist. Innovation guy. Beautiful <laughs> books like X. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, eight eight time best selling author, keynote speaker, and he's a colleague of mine at at the company with the blue cloud. Uh, so, so uh, Ray, uh, your closing remarks on uh, extraordinary three extraordinary authors and and um, individuals. You know, I, I think what we're going to discover is that over the last 18 months, um, people have had the time to think, reevaluate priorities, uh, really express themselves, understand where they're going to head next. I'm really excited for the next uh, 18 months ahead because that's where we're going to see a lot of innovation. We're going to see a lot of new ideas come into play. Um, we'll see some of the best of the old ideas as well. But I think that's what we should be looking for, especially as we get into 2022 as it comes along, and especially as we start planning for 2022. What about you, Vala? I'm just recapping Dr. Tali, Peter High, Asha's. Uh, oh, God, we can't sleep for right. hours if you do that. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, uh, it was so many pearls of wisdom. Definitely read Dr. Tali's articles, short read, very profound. Check the blogs, yeah. Yeah, and, and Peter has been talking about building world class IT for years, and he's extraordinary and super articulate. I always say smart people use simple language. With all three guests, I was able to consume and understand their thesis and point of view, which is uh, just just terrific. So anyway, um, really enjoyed the, the show. We're, Ray, we're getting close to 800 interviews. So 
it's such a privilege and an honor. We can't get to 100 books, but we'll get to 800 interviews, maybe a thousand. Yeah, 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 exactly, <laughs> exactly. Let's see if we can have the highest number of podcast interviews because the books, yeah, I'm tapping out. Anyway, I look forward to um, seeing you in person at Constellation Connect Enterprise in October. And uh, yeah. uh, and it's uh, it's uh, it's I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. So anyway, well, thank thanks, you everybody. Thanks, if it's Friday, you. it's Disrupt TV. Join us 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. And if it's Friday, we'll catch you here. And of course, catch all the replays on our site as well. You can catch us anywhere where podcasts are found, and of course, on our YouTube site as well as anything at Disrupt TV Show. Thanks a lot, everybody. Happy Friday. Bye, everyone.